about two centuries pass after the Merneptah Stila places the Israelites in Canaan. Families grow into tribes. Their population increases. David put his hand into the bag. He took out a stone and slung it. It struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell down on the ground. 1 Samuel 1749. The Bible celebrates David as a shepherd boy who vanquishes the giant Goliath. A lover who lusts after forbidden fruits. And a poet who composes lyric psalms still recited today. Of all the names in the Hebrew Bible, none appears more than David. Scriptures say David creates a kingdom that stretches from Egypt to Mesopotamia. He makes Jerusalem his royal capital. And in a new covenant, Yahweh promises that he and his descendants will rule forever. David's son Solomon builds the temple where Yahweh, now the national God of Israel, will dwell for eternity. The kingdom of David and Solomon, one nation united under one God, according to the Bible. Now, some skeptics today have argued there was no such thing as a united monarchy. It's a later biblical construct, and particularly a construct of modern scholarship. In short, there was no David. As one of the biblical revisionists has said, David is no more historical than King Arthur. But then, in 1993, an amazing discovery literally shed new light on what the Bible calls ancient Israel's greatest king. Gila Cook was finishing up some survey work with an assistant at Tel Dan, a biblical site in the far north of Israel today. The excavation was headed by the eminent Israeli archaeologist Avraham Biran. It was near the end of the day, and Cook was getting her last measurements when she hears a yell from below. And it was Biran and his booming voice yelling, Gila, let's go. And so I waved to him, hold it, and continued working. Okay. After being summoned by Biran a second time, Cook had her assistant load her up. And she started down the hill. So I get there and I just drop my bag and drop the board and I set my stuff down. But something catches her eye. A stone with what appeared to be random scratches, but was actually an ancient inscription. This time, she yelled for Biran. And he looks at it and he looks at me and he says, Oh my God! Cook had found a fragment of a victory stela written in Aramaic, an ancient language very similar to Hebrew. Dedicated by the king of Damascus, or one of his generals, it celebrates the conquest of Israel, boasting, I slew mighty kings who harnessed thousands of chariots and thousands of horsemen. I killed the king of the house of David. Those words, the house of David, make this a critical discovery. They are strong evidence that David really lived. Unlike Genesis, the stories of Israel's kings move the biblical narrative out of the realm of legend and into the light of history. The later we come in time, the firmer ground we stand on. We have better sources, we have more written sources, we have more contemporary eyewitness sources. When the biblical chronology of Israel's kings can be cross-referenced with historical inscriptions, 
like the Tel Dan Stila, they can provide scholars with fairly reliable dates. King David is the earliest biblical figure confirmed by archaeology to be historical. And most scholars agree he lived around 1000 BC, the 10th century. Could any of the Bible have been written during David's reign? The earliest Hebrew alphabet, discovered by Ram Tapi, carved on a stone at Tel Zayit, provides an enticing clue. Could these scribes have been in the court of King David and his son Solomon? Could they have been the earliest biblical writers? In the 18th century, German scholars uncovered a clue to who wrote the Bible, hidden in two different names for God. According to one account, Abraham knew God by his intimate personal name, conventionally pronounced Yahweh. Passages with the name Yahweh, which in German is spelled with a J, scholars refer to as J. But according to other accounts, Abraham knew God simply by the most common Hebrew word for God, which is Elohim. So the two different writers became known as E for Elohim and J for Yahweh. Most likely based on poetry and songs passed down for generations, they both write a version of Israel's distant past. The stories of Abraham in the Promised Land, Moses and the Exodus. The earliest of these sources is the one that is known as J, which many scholars dated to the 10th century BC, the time of David and Solomon. And because the backdrop for Jay's version of events is the area around Jerusalem, it's likely he lived there, perhaps in the royal courts of David and Solomon. For Christians, Jesus comes in his final week to worship at the Jerusalem temple. He's crucified, he's buried, he's resurrected in the city of Jerusalem. For Islam, it is the site where Muhammad comes in a sacred night journey. And today, the Dome of the Rock marks that spot. In Judaism, the stories of the Hebrew Bible of Solomon, of David, of the temples of Jerusalem, all of these take place, of course, in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is a symbol of sacred space today, important for all three traditions. Despite the difficulties, Israeli archaeologist Eilat Mazar went digging in the most ancient part of Jerusalem, today called the City of David. We started the excavations here because we wanted uh, to check uh, and to examine the possibility that the remains of King David's palace are here. But because this area has been fought over, destroyed, and rebuilt over thousands of years, it was a long shot that any biblical remains would survive. But then... Large walls started to appear, three meter wide, five meter wide, and then we saw that it goes all direction. It goes from east, 30 meter to the west, and we don't see the end of it yet. Such huge walls can only be part of a massive building. And Mazar believes her excavations to date represent only 20% of its total size. Such a huge structure shows centralization and capability of, of construction. It can be only royal structure. This huge complex may be evidence of a kingdom, but is it David's kingdom? The locations of these strikingly similar gates in both regions suggest a single governing authority throughout the land.
But how can we be sure this is the kingdom of David and Solomon? The answer, once again, lies in Egypt. The head-splitting scene which you see on this wall commemorates a military campaign conducted by Pharaoh Shishak, or Sheshonk, the founder of Dynasty 22 in Egypt. The Egyptian Pharaoh Shishak invades Israel, an event the Bible reports and specifically dates to five years after Solomon's death, during the reign of his son, Rehoboam. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, King Sheshak of Egypt marched against Jerusalem and carried off the treasures of the house of Yahweh and the treasures of the royal palace. He carried off everything. 1 Kings 14, 25 and 26. The importance of this in fixing one of the earliest dates, specific dates, in which Egyptian history coincides with biblical history is, is really startling and, and has to be taken note of. This stunning convergence between the Bible and Egyptian history gives a firm date for the death of Solomon. Shishak's campaign, according to the well-established Egyptian chronology, dates to 925 B.C. And the Bible says Solomon dies five years earlier, which means 930 B.C. This is further evidence that David and Solomon lived in the 10th century. But there's even more hidden in these walls. These ovals, with their depictions of bound captives in city walls, represent places Pharaoh Shishak conquered in Israel. One of those places is Gezer where archaeologists find the hallmark of Solomon's building program, a six-chambered gate. Bill Deaver directed the excavations in the late 1960s. We can actually see vivid evidence here of a destruction. Down below, we have the original stones pretty much in situ. But if you look in here, you see the stones are badly cracked. You can even see where they're burned from the heat of a huge fire that has been built here. And then up in here, you see the fire has been so intense that the soft limestone has melted into lime and it flows down like lava. This is vivid evidence of a destruction, and we would connect that with this well-known raid of Pharaoh Shishak. And if the gate was destroyed by Shishak in 925 BC, then it must have been built during the lifetime of Solomon, who died just five years earlier. Surely this kind of monumental architecture is evidence of state formation. And if it's in the 10th century, then Solomon. Although a minority of archeologists continue to disagree, this convergence of the Bible Egyptian chronology and Solomon's gates is powerful evidence that a great kingdom existed at the time of David and Solomon spanning all of Israel north and south with its capital in Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is more than a political center. It is the center of worship. The magic of Jerusalem is the magic of the temple. One temple for the one God. The result is that Jerusalem and the temple right, emerge as powerful symbols, not just of the oneness of God, but also of the oneness of the Jewish people. The worship of the ancient Israelites bears little resemblance to Judaism today. It's centered around the temple, built by David's son Solomon and seen as Yahweh's earthly dwelling. To understand how the ancient Israelites worshipped their God, scholars must discover what the temple looked like and how it functioned. But although archaeologists know where its remains should be, it is impossible to dig there. It lies under the third holiest site in Islam, 
which includes the Dome of the Rock. Not a stone of Solomon's temple has ever been excavated. But the Bible offers a remarkably detailed description. The house which King Solomon built for Yahweh was 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. In the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim, each 10 cubits high. He overlaid the cherubim with gold. 1 Kings 6, 2, 23, and 28. The Bible's description suggests a floor plan for Solomon's temple. And it is strikingly similar to temples built by neighboring peoples who worship many gods. The closest in appearance is a temple hundreds of miles to the north of Jerusalem at Ain Dara in modern-day Syria. They have similar dimensions and the same basic floor plan. Guarding both temples are sphinxes, or cherubim, as the Bible calls them. Unique to the temple at Ain Dara are the enormous footprints of the god who lived here. They mark his progress as he strode to his throne in the innermost sanctuary. If we take the details that we find of Solomon's temple in the book of Kings and compare it with the Aindara temple, we can piece together a fairly good picture, I think, of what this temple uh, might have looked like in the age of Solomon. Now it is possible to reconstruct with some confidence how Solomon's temple may have looked and how the ancient Israelites worshipped their God. Out front was an enormous altar. Beyond that was a porch area that led into the inside of the temple. There was a room, the holy place. And then beyond that, the most sacred room, the Holy of Holies, where tradition says the Ark of the Covenant held the tablets of the law. And this room was considered to be the most sacred site on earth because it is the room where God's presence could be found. And the ancient Israelites believed their God demanded a very specific form of worship. Evidence of this survives today on Mount Gerizim in Palestine. The Samaritans who live here claim direct descent from the ancient tribes of Israel. According to their tradition, for over 2,500 years, they have been practicing the ancient Israelite form of worship, animal sacrifice. The primary function is to make a connection between our mundane world and the divine world. And the means for the ancient Israelites is embodied in blood. Blood is the most sacred substance on the altar. And blood is the substance that embodies life. So it is the most precious substance in the human world. But while the priests were offering sacrifice to Yahweh in the temple, many Israelites were not as loyal. At Tel Rehov, archaeologists are digging at an Israelite house that illuminates the religious practices of its ancient inhabitants. Well, we just found this beautiful, exceptional clay figurine showing a goddess 
a fertility goddess that was worshipped here in Israel. Here, in this case, she is shown holding a baby. Who is this fertility goddess? And what is a pagan idol doing in an Israelite home? Dramatic evidence as to her possible identity first surfaced in 1968. Bill Deaver was carrying out salvage excavations in tombs in southern Israel. When a local brought him an inscription that had been robbed from one of them. When I got home and brushed it off, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Executed in a clear 8th century script. It's a tomb inscription. And uh, it just gives the name of the deceased and says, Blessed may X be by Yahweh. That's a good biblical Hebrew. But it says by Yahweh and his Asherah. And Asherah is the name of the old Canaanite mother goddess. More inscriptions associating Yahweh and Asherah have been discovered. And thousands of figurines unearthed throughout Israel. Many scholars believe this is the face of Asherah. Deaver concludes God had a wife. Even hundreds of years after the Israelites rise from their Canaanite pagan roots, monotheism has still not completely taken hold. This is awkward for some people, the notion that, that Israelite religion was not exclusively monotheistic, but we know now that it wasn't. The Bible admits the Israelites continue to worship Asherah and other Canaanite gods, such as Baal. In fact, the prophets, holy men speaking in the name of God, consistently rail against breaking the covenant made with Moses to worship only Yahweh. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Hosea 11, 2. The Israelites had made a contract with God. If they kept it, God would reward them. If they broke it, he would punish them. He would punish them by using foreign powers as his instruments. Events seemed to fulfill the prophet's dire predictions. Soon after Solomon's death, the ten northern tribes rebel and form the northern kingdom of Israel. Then a powerful new enemy storms out of Mesopotamia to create the largest empire the Near East had ever known, the Assyrians. The Assyrians were the overpowering military force and Israel and Judah, the two states that the Bible talks about as the states making up the people Israel, fell under the sway of the Assyrian juggernaut. Numerous Assyrian texts and reliefs vividly document their domination of Israel and Judah. In 722 BC, the Assyrian army crushes the northern kingdom. Those who escape death or exile to Assyria flood south into Jerusalem, where the descendants of David and Solomon continue to reign. One of them, Josiah, according to the Bible, finally heeds what the prophets prescribe. We're told in the book of Kings that King Josiah in the late seventh century BC was told that a scroll had been discovered in the temple archives. The scroll was brought to him and as the scroll was being read, Josiah began to weep because he realized that it was a sacred text containing divine commands which the people had been Scholars believe that the lost scroll is part of the fifth book of the Torah, Deuteronomy, a detailed code of laws and observance. It inspires another group of scribes in the 7th century BC, whom scholars call 
the D Riders. According to the documentary hypothesis, after J and E, D is the third group of scribes who write part of the Hebrew Bible. D retells the Exodus story and reaffirms the covenant Moses made between God and the Israelite people. You should love the Lord your God because he has loved you. He has loved you more than any other nation. So the divine love for Israel requires a corresponding loyalty to God, an exclusive loyalty to God. And Deuteronomy, more than other parts of the Bible, is insistent that only the God of Israel is to be worshipped. To enforce the covenant, Josiah orders that idols and altars to all other deities be destroyed. The book of Deuteronomy contains the clearest prohibition of the worship of other gods, the Ten Commandments. I am Yahweh, your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Deuteronomy 5, 6 through 9. By associating the belief in one God with moral behavior, the Ten Commandments establishes a code of morality and justice for all the ideal of Western civilization. Despite Josiah's reforms, the ancient Israelites continued to worship other gods. Their acceptance of one God and the triumph of monotheism begins with a series of events vividly attested through archaeology, ancient texts, and the Bible. It starts with the destruction of Yahweh's earthly dwelling, the Jerusalem Temple. In 586 BC, after defeating the Assyrians, a new Mesopotamian Empire invades Israel. The Babylonians ransack the temple and systematically burn the sacred city. Before his eyes, the Babylonian victors slay the sons of Zedekiah, the last Davidic king, then blind him. The covenant, the promise made by Yahweh to his chosen people and to David, that his dynasty would rule eternally in Jerusalem, is broken. After 400 years, Israel is wiped out. The destruction of Jerusalem created one of the most significant theological crises in the history of the Jewish people. The Babylonians round up the Israelite priests, prophets, and scribes and drag them in chains to Babylon. Babylonian records confirm the presence of Israelites, including the king, in exile. In every age of disbelief, one is inclined to think God is dead. And surely those who survived the fall of Jerusalem must have thought so. After all, how could God allow his temple, his house, the sign, visible sign of his presence among his people to be destroyed? Without temple, king, or land, how can the Israelites survive? Their journey begins with the ancient scrolls, which some scholars speculate were rescued from the flames of the destruction. Among the exiles from Jerusalem to Babylon were priests from the temple. And they seem to have brought with them their sacred documents, their sacred traditions. According to the widely accepted documentary hypothesis, it is here in Babylon, far from their homes in Israel, that priests and scribes will produce much of the Hebrew Bible as it is known today. Scholars refer to these writers as P, or the priestly source. 
It was P who took all of these earlier traditions, the J source, the E source, the D source, and other sources as well, and combined them into what we know as the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. But more than just compiling, P edits and writes a version of Israel's distant past, including the Abraham story, that provides a way for the Israelites to remain a people and maintain their covenant with God. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Genesis 17, 11. When Genesis 17 attributes a covenantal value to circumcision, it is not really talking about Abraham. It is really talking about the exiles of the 6th century BCE, who, far from their native home, were desperately trying to find a way to reaffirm their difference. Therefore, they began to look at circumcision as not simply another practice, but rather as the marker of the covenant, and they attributed this view back to Abraham. To the exiles, the Babylonians are the new Canaanites, the idol-worshipping, uncircumcised peoples from whom they must remain apart. But the Abraham story, with its harrowing tale of a father's willingness to sacrifice his own son, is also about the power of faith. It is no coincidence that the exiled peace scribes place Abraham's origins in Ur, just down the river from Babylon. Perhaps with the same faith as Abraham had, so too will the exiles be returned to the promised land. One of the pervasive themes in the Torah is the theme of exile and return. Abraham goes down to Egypt and comes out of Egypt. The Israelites go to Egypt and get out. For the exiles in Babylon in the 6th century BC, that theme must have resonated very powerfully. God, who had acted on their behalf in the past, would presumably do so again. But the Israelites still have a problem. How, in a foreign land, without the temple and sacrifice, can they redeem themselves in the eyes of Yahweh? To assure that divine protection, the P tradition emphasizes observances such as the Sabbath observance. You don't need to be in the land of Israel to keep the Sabbath. And we have allusions in the biblical writings, in the prophets, to the fact that the exiles also learned to pray in groups in what was to become the forerunner of the synagogue. It is during this period, through the exile, that the exiles realized that even far away from their homeland, without a temple, without the priesthood, without kings, they're still able to worship God, be loyal to God, and to follow God's commandments. This is the foundation of Judaism. The experience of the exile transforms ancient Israelite cult into a modern religion. By compiling the stories of their past, originally written by the scribes J, E, and D, the Exodus, from slavery to freedom, Moses and the Ten Commandments, Abraham's journey to the Promised Land, he creates what we know today as the first five books of the Bible. Though this theory is widely accepted, physical evidence of any biblical text from the exile or earlier is hard to come by.
The most celebrated surviving biblical texts are the Dead Sea Scrolls. First discovered by accident in 1947, the scrolls represent nearly all 39 books of the Hebrew Bible, at least in fragments. They survived because they were deposited in the perfect environment for preservation, the hot, dry desert. Archaeologists suspect there were at least hundreds more scrolls throughout Israel. But because they were written on papyrus or animal skins, they have long since decomposed. Even though the earliest of the Dead Sea Scrolls date to the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC, that doesn't mean that they're the first copies or examples of this work that were ever written. It means that they already stand in a line of tradition that had been established uh, by the time the scrolls were written. Still, the earliest of the Dead Sea Scrolls dates to at least 300 years after the Babylonian exile. In the absence of proof of earlier text, some scholars claim the entire Bible is pious fiction, and even doubt whether Israel and the Israelites ever existed. For many of the revisionists, these extreme skeptics, there was no ancient Israel. Israel is an intellectual construct. In other words, these people were not rethinking their past, they were inventing their past. They had no past. So the Bible is a myth, a foundation myth, told to legitimate a people who had no legitimacy. Came here and excavated. Gabriel Barkai instructed a 13 year old volunteer to clean up a tomb for photographs. Instead of that, he was bored, he was alone, and he had a hammer, and he began banging on the floor. But the floor turned out to be a fallen ceiling. And beneath it were some artifacts that had escaped the looters. Among the hundreds of grave goods, one artifact stood out. It looked like a cigarette butt. It was cylindrical, about an inch in size, about half an inch in diameter, and it was very clear it is made of silver. It was some kind of a tiny scroll. A second, slightly smaller scroll was also found, and both were taken to the labs at the Israel Museum. But unraveling the scrolls to see if they contain a readable inscription could risk destroying them completely. Andy Vaughn was one of the epigraphers on the project. I went over there and I was amazed to see the whole thing full of uh, very delicately scratched, very shallow uh, characters. The first word that I could decipher already on the spot was yud hey vav hey which is the four-lettered, unpronounceable name of God. Further investigation revealed more text and a surprisingly familiar prayer, still said in synagogues and churches to this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Numbers 6, 24 through 26. There is no doubt at all that these two amulets contain the priestly benediction found in number 6. These inscriptions are thus very important because they're the earliest references we have to the written biblical narratives. The archaeological context was very clear because it was found together with pottery dating back to the 7th century BC. Also the paleography, the shape of letters, points towards uh, somewhere in the 7th century BC beyond any doubt. The silver scrolls 
with the priestly benediction predate the earliest Dead Sea Scrolls by 400 years. It is an amazing find, proving that at least some verses of the Bible were written in ancient times during the reign of King David's descendants. By giving us text from before the Babylonian exile, the Silver Scrolls confirm that the Hebrew Bible is created from poetry, oral traditions, and prayers that go back to the time of Josiah's D writer, and likely beyond to writers E and J. As modern scholars suspect, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, takes its final form during the Babylonian exile. But dwarfed by the mighty temples and giant statues of Babylonian gods, the Israelites must also confront the fundamental question, why did their god, Yahweh, forsake them? In the ancient world, if your country was destroyed by another country, it meant that their gods were more powerful than your god. And the natural thing to do was to worship the more powerful god. But the survivors continued to worship Yahweh and struggled to understand how this could have happened. They resort first to a standard form of explanation which is found elsewhere in the ancient Near East. We must have done something wrong to incur the wrath of our God. It's out of this that comes the reflection that polytheism was our downfall. There is, after all, only one God. The Israelites abandon the folly of polytheism. Monotheism triumphs, and the archaeological evidence proves it. Before the destruction of the first temple, wherever we dig, in whatever part of the Judean country, we find sanctuaries, and more often we find hundreds and thousands of figurines, even in Jerusalem itself. But after the destruction, there are none. We are speaking about thousands in before, and nothing, completely nothing at all after. Monotheism is well ensconced, firmly ensconced. So something major happened, which is very hard to trace. But that was a searing experience, that time in the exile. Through the experience of the exile and writing the Bible, the concept of God, as it is known today, is born. In a way, P created something that was much greater, because it was greater than any individual land or kingdom. It was, it was a kind of of a universal religion based on a creator God, not, a, not just a God of a single nation, but the, the God of the world, the God of the universe. This moves Yahweh into the realm of being a universal deity who has the power to affect what happens in the whole universe. This makes the God of ancient Israel the universal God of the, of the world that resonates with people, at least in Jewish, Christian, and Muslim tradition to this very day. In 539 BC, the Babylonian Empire is toppled by the Persians. As written in the Bible, Yahweh, in his new role as the one invisible God, orchestrates a new exodus. Among one group of returning exiles is the prophet Ezra. Back in Jerusalem, he gives a public reading of the newly written Torah to re-establish the covenant. All the people gathered together. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. He read from it from early morning until midday, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Nehemiah 8, 1-3. To me, it's one of the most moving moments in the whole Bible. Ezra returns with the Bible in his hands, so we have the feeling that the process begun in the exile is finally finished, and Ezra has a copy. 
the scrolls that chronicle the Israelites' relationship with their God, is now the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, a sacred text for over three billion people.